I've seen people shame folks for wanting to get their stimulus check. I'm going to tell you what the woman told me at the welfare office when I went to apply. I sat there in that welfare office and I waited for them to call my name, David. And I went back, sat at the the table across from this woman and she started asking me questions and I start breaking down because I was ashamed and I was sniffling. And then I just was like ugly crying right there at the desk. And she said, wait a minute, have you been paying your taxes? Were you paying your taxes before all this started? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, and you paid them regularly? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, and how long have you been working? I said, since I was like 13, 14 years old, I've been doing some type of work. And she said, you have made deposits into this system. It's okay for you to make a withdrawal now. Somebody is on our show today who I've had before. Man, the amount of the amount of downloads that we got from the previous episode uh, featuring uh, Patrice Washington. I think she's our number one guest so far over 60 some episodes. You all just loved her. And she was just talking, you know, her story and and giving you some tips. But now she is here to help you get those damn tools back into your toolbox. The one that Corona stole from you on that day, on that night in March. She is going to give you specific, specific ideas on how to get those tools back. And she's the one to do it. She's America's money maven. You've seen her on TV everywhere. She's a regular contributor on the Steve Harvey radio show. She's written five books. You can find out all about her at patricewashington.com. She's also, uh, well, just Google her. She's all over the place. She, she's done amazing videos, too. I'll tell you, video cameras love her. All right. So check out patricewashington.com. I have her here because she has lived a story that you're living right now. Maybe not the same exact story, but her story is she had it all. She lost it all. And I mean, lost it all. And then she got it back. There was a time that she owned a 6,000 square foot house. She had all the fancy cars. She had the Mercedes. She, she had everything. She had everything. She and her husband, they had everything. They were real estate gurus. And then the meltdown came. You know, that big 2008, 2009 meltdown. And guess what happened? The Great Recession took everything away from them and then they were like in a little one bedroom apartment they were barely surviving uh her husband actually went to taco bell and worked for over a year can you imagine going from a six thousand square foot house driving around that fancy car down sunset boulevard to going to, to work in a taco bell now, now uh, hey hey there's nothing wrong with taco bell I know a lot of us right now, a lot of you listening right now would love to have a job at Taco Bell. You'd love to have any job right now. So I'm not putting down our fast food employees around the country. I love you, especially those that work at Chick-fil-A. But I am telling you right now, they lost everything. And then they had to figure out how to get it back. They had to figure out how to restock their toolbox. So Patrice is here today. I always say hey, Patrice. It's it's Patrice. I always have a hard time with that. You know, it's a southern Southern Ohio boy thing that comes out of me. I guess Patrice Washington. How's that? Well, she is here today to help restore those tools that Corona stole from you in March, and April, and May. And June, she, she is here to help you get those tools back. And she's going to give you practical ideas. So here's what I want you to do. First thing, I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pen. You're going to want to take notes. I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, you're going to want to take notes. Okay. And the second thing I want you to do is to go to her website and, and to watch her videos and to watch the power of her ability to explain things so that they are so daggone simple. She has these pillars of 
information that her foundation is built on. So I really encourage you, once you listen to this podcast, to go over to her website at patricewashington.com. All right. So uh, I'm going to get to it. I'm, I'm going to shut up. Sometimes you folks, you send me a note going, you know what? Why don't you just get to it? We don't need to hear you talking for hours. I try not to talk for hours, just minutes, but I know it seems like hours. So let's get to my interview that I just did. Just I'm literally, literally, it's right hot off the press. My interview with Patrice Washington. Well, hello, Patrice. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, my gosh. How the world has changed since we last spoke. (laughs) <laughs> oh my, yes it has. It's a whole new world out here. So um you're in Georgia. Georgia's somewhat opened up. Tennessee's somewhat opened up. I'm still hunkered here. down. Well, I'm personally hunkered down. I really didn't care what the governor said. I was I'm not like I have no reason to rush out. I think that's the the blessing of working from home anyway, is that my normal life beyond speaking. Um, you know, going traveling for speaking looks like quarantine. So right. I'm, not one of the, I'm not one of the people who has cabin fever because I'm kind of just used to this being my life. So, yeah, you know, but I, I understand the pain of it. In just a few weeks time, isn't amazing. Uh, I know myself, I, I, I was just I, I had all this pent up energy, this anxiety, this uh, just something inside me that wasn't right and i decided one day i just got to go out and walk it off and in 30 days i walked what did i walk 125 miles now i'm up to about i'm I'm averaging about five miles a day i'm right behind you i do about four i do about four miles a day just going around my um subdivision here (laughs) that's that's what i do yeah i have a route and I know exactly what cul-de-sacs I need to hit. Some of the cul-de-sacs are like a like a little hilly. So I get a good burn in my thighs and in my calves. And I've been doing the same thing about, well, about four days a week. I do four miles a day. Well, they say if you do something consistently for 30 days, you, 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 you can totally change uh, the way you look at things and change your habits. Yeah. yeah. And I've met more neighbors just waving from the street. So uh, You know, I did nice. I, I, I forgot about the days. I mean, it's been since I was a kid that I've seen two things. Number one, a lot of people sitting on their front porches. Mm-hmm. The second thing is the I, I have seen dads in the street playing ball with their kids. Yeah. Now, I have oh, not yeah. seen that since I was like 12 when I was one of those kids. And isn't that the blessing of this time? You got to get back to basics. Yeah, there is. You know, and and I I think one of the things and one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you because uh, you've, you you know, part of your story, which which we shared before in a podcast and on the show, is how you had it all, lost it all, and then you came back from that. And I really think that we are in a time where – People have an empty toolbox. Somebody came in the middle of the night by the name of Corona and stole the all the tools out of the toolbox. And now we're left without the hammer, the the, the uh, screwdriver, the saw, all of those essential tools. They're all gone. So I really couldn't wait to talk to you to find out, you know, looking at your own life and looking yeah. at the time that you lost it all. Uh-huh. Take us back to that time and what your mindset was and relate it to what we're going through now. You know, the thing that I have been saying since the lockdown or the shelter in place first occurred, um, I, I had a sense that it wasn't going to be just a couple weeks, right? My initial sense was, mm, this seems like it could go on for months. And if we're not careful, turn into a full blown recession. And for me, that is the season that made me who I am. You know, honestly, it was in a time like this of uncertainty, 
of feeling like you got the rug pulled out from under you, of being just completely confused from day to day about what's going on. That's how I felt in the recession as a real estate and mortgage brokerage owner. I didn't know what was going on from day to day. And my entire identity had been consumed with the thing that I was doing at that time. And so why this is so similar for me is that when I look back at that time, 11 years ago now, I realized that it didn't happen to me, it happened for me. It happened for me in order to really tap in to what God was truly calling me to do. Because up until that point, I had been exposed to certain things, but I did, definitely didn't see what I did at that time as purposeful, right? I didn't acknowledge any gifting in particular. I didn't really acknowledge how what I was doing in the world could actually be a blessing to other people. And it wasn't until I lost everything in the recession and was at that point of literally going from a seven-figure business to scraping up change and applying for welfare that I was forced to really search myself and ask myself, well, what are my actual gifts? Like, what am I really good at? What, you know, what could I do for days on end without without fail? Like, without losing a loss of uh, uh, a spirit of enthusiasm around it. And that's how I realized, and that's how I tapped into the fact. And this may seem so basic, David, but that's how I realized that my gift was just speaking. Because I had that downtime, I had been so used to being busy, I had never stopped to really think about what am I truly good at? Like, what is God really calling me to do? At the time, all I knew is like, oh, I make great money. So as long as I felt like at that time, as long as I make great money, I'm fine. But that that disruption, that interruption, that not being able to close a real estate deal to save my life was the time, the, the slower pace that I needed to really go, okay, Patrice, what are you supposed to be doing? And that was the opportunity to look back over my life up until that point and see that the thing that I had been most gifted to do was talk. It was the very thing that I got in trouble for (laughs) my entire life, but I dismissed it for so long because after all, it was just talking. That's what I used to say. You know, it's it's interesting. I have um, some of the people that that I work with, some of the talent, that I work with, um, they've been telling me for years that they have a book in them, and uh, but they just don't have the time to write. Uh-huh. And uh, so I've encouraged them to uh, use this time to write that book that they claim they have in them. Nine people, I'm, I'm trying to see one, two, no, of the nine people that I've had this conversation with, we're what, in week eight, something uh-huh. like that? Two of them are writing the book. Mm-hmm. Okay, the the other seven, it's uh, you know, I, frankly, I don't really know quite what they're doing. I know, I know they're drinking a lot more alcohol. That much I know. But <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, two of them have actually taken that, and and I, and I believe that they 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 believe that they are putting their their gifts, their 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 wordsmith, their their abilities down on paper. Uh, like you discovered what your gift was during that period. I, I believe that they are going to find that gift or, and, and they've been on that journey. They've been on that um, that um, a journey of discovery for the past uh, two months. Uh-huh. So this is a really interesting time to pivot. Yeah. to look at things differently look look at some of the things that uh, i mean i never even heard of zoom before this by the way i mean I'm, <laughs> I, I, I think i'm pretty up on things but i'm sorry you know zoom was not right in in my vision you know i i just mm-hmm. i knew that this stuff existed i knew google hangout existed but things like zoom i had no idea and now look at it Oh, now it's an everyday necessity, right? It, it, I mean, think about before email was attached to your cell phone, right? Like before Blackberries and all that. I remember in high school when the school district in Los Angeles wanted to give all of us email addresses. And I didn't even get the waiver sign because I thought email was a fad. I was like, who needs to do that? I could just call my friends. I was like 16 years old. 
<laughs> and you fast forward a couple of years, by the time I get to college, the only way I could communicate with other students and with my professors was via email. It became such a necessity and imagine our lives without it. It, you know, people are like, oh, I can't wait to go back to normal. Um, there's going to be a new version of normal. I don't think that there is going back, which is why we have to be okay with looking at ourselves. And again, looking at what has this opportunity come to show me, right? There's only two options here. It's a lesson or a blessing. And I know that that is hard for some people to receive. I mean, me, myself, I have childhood friends that have been completely impacted and devastated with parents dying, children dying, you know, from COVID-19. So I'm not making light of that at all. And I just want to be clear about that. I do think, however, on the other side, there is opportunity if we allow it. And if you keep a closed mind about what this time could do for you or could bring to you, when we are let outside, <laughs> you know, when we can't go back out, I think it's still going to look drastically different than what you may be used to. And the people who are going to prevail, honestly, are going to be the people who are allowing their purpose to evolve, to meet the needs of this time. Not people who are like, but in 2019, okay, but this isn't 2019. So what may have worked six months ago may not work for you in your business or just how you handle relationships or how you do your normal everyday activities, that just may not be the same afterwards. And you have to learn to be okay with that. Because if we believe that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, then we can't say except for COVID-19. We have to believe that this time is here and there's still opportunity in it for us. So what have you learned over the years when you had to uh, look at things differently, pivot and, and just uh, um, uh, sort of take inventory and, and by, by the way, maybe had next to nothing in the bank. All right. Next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, look at things differently. It's another thing to, to say, oh, my gosh, I, I, I can't afford to buy groceries. Um, I can't afford to put gas in, the, although who can't afford to put gas in the car these days? I think it's a buck a gallon, but yeah. I, I'm sure that there are some people out there that right now that don't have that buck. Let's look at things from a dire standpoint because, mm -hmm. you know, you are in a, in a um, unique situation. I'm in a unique situation. Mm -hmm. A lot of our friends are in a unique situation. We, we've been through hell and back. Uh, yeah. we, we we've 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 been tested and turned that into testimonies mm -hmm. but but there are a lot of people right now that are just for the first time going through this they had a plan they had it worked out they they were doing their thing every day maybe they had to work a couple of jobs but it was working out they had the big screen tv they were paying their rent uh they got their credit score above 700 yeah and now all of a sudden, they're the bad guy. You mm -hmm. know, they can't. They're the the maybe the landlord gave them a month off, but now the landlord's saying, "Hey, I got bills too, right? right? Help me help those people that are listening right now. What would you tell them? Where do they even begin?" So one of the first things that I would say, because that was me, right? So much of what you described at the height of the recession is exactly where. I was, it was making a decision between, do we pay this power bill or do we buy, you know, groceries? And I remember the day that I had to chase the power man down with my baby on my hip and beg this man to turn the power back on to my apartment at that time, or my baby's milk would spoil. And Lord knows I didn't have money for more milk, right? So I definitely have been in those places. And I would say, starting with, um, the first thing for me was, David, I didn't, when everything first started happening with the recession, I didn't rush to take advantage of anything that was made available because I call, I had what I call now premature pride, um, meaning that when mortgage modifications were being talked about and then, you know, on the news, they were throwing out all these different things that maybe people could get help with. I thought, surely I will get through this because in my mind, I had been 
doing all the things. I was fine. I had a little bit of savings and I had, I had the stuff. And so I could figure it out for the next several months where that became a problem is because I waited until my back was all the way up against the wall. And I was at the point of checking couch cushions for coins before I started to seek the help of nonprofit organizations, of any governmental agencies, I, I really felt like that's not for me, that's for other people. And I see the same thing happening every day now, just in social media. I've seen people shame folks for wanting to get their stimulus check or wanting to go and um, apply for any government resources. And my thing is, if you were rolling along and you were doing the things that you needed to do, I'm going to tell you what the woman told me at the welfare office when I went to apply. I sat there in that welfare office and I waited for them to call my name, David. And I went back, sat at the, the table across from this woman and she started asking me questions and I start breaking down because I was ashamed and I was sniffling. And then I just was like ugly crying right there at the desk. And she said, wait a minute. Like, calm down, get it together. And she said, have you been paying your taxes? Were you paying your taxes before all this started? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, and you paid them regularly? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, and how long have you been working? I said, since I was like 13, 14 years old, I've been doing some type of work. And she said, you have made deposits into this system. It's okay for you to make a withdrawal now. There is no shame in you needing to make a withdrawal. You deserve this, so don't make it into something it's not. And that, when I tell you, <laughs> gave me such peace and comfort. She didn't say it nicely. She was a little, she was a little harsh about it, <laughs> but it gave me such peace and comfort because I needed it at that time. And so instead of you know, going months and months and months with this idea of shame and guilt and I'm the bad guy and I should have saved more, I should have done this, I should have done that. This is no time to be in beat up about where you are. This is the time to find every resource possibly available to you and take advantage of it as best as possible. This is the time to seek wise counsel. This is not the time to suffer in silence and stay home by yourself, maybe just mulling it over with you know, whomever you're sheltering in place with, but to literally reach out to people, you know, that you trust, that you, that you love or people who, you know, um, in the community, in your local organizations, your churches, get on Google. Thank God that we have Google and we can find so many resources and look for what you need. It's not okay to stay still and suffer in silence when there's so much information at your fingertips. And we all have unique needs. So I would say just make it okay to go and get what you need. Don't wait until it's too late. That's one of the things I did was wait until it was very, very late to get support. And if I had any advice, I would say get what you need now. That's good. And, and uh, you know, I just want to remind folks who are listening, I, I think that's one thing we hear our leaders saying over again where they remind us, look, it's, it's not your fault. There are a lot of things that we have done in our lives where, you know, yeah, we, we did screw up. It was our fault. But this is certainly not one of them. And I think that uh, you, you're just reminding us, don't don't let pride get in the way. Uh, we're all in this situation. It's not our fault. And if, if the help is there, uh, jump at it. Take it. Because uh, it may not be there in a few months. So, and okay, so, so you took the help. It, it helped you put food on the table uh -huh. then what happened you woke up and discovered what i woke up and discovered that i was unemployable <laughs> that's in my story that's what happened i woke up and started to try to apply for jobs at that time i was like that's the responsible thing to do as an adult is apply for a job, you have a child, you need health care, you need all the things you need, uh, you know, to be able to provide or contribute to your family. And so every job that I applied for, though, I was told I was either underqualified or overqualified. The only thing I had done up until that point was run my own business straight out of college. And that's when it became really apparent to me that I was going to have to go back to tapping into those gifts that I talked about. Um, 
when I had my moment, I call it my defining moment, being on the bathroom floor, fed up and just tired. I, it started not on the floor. It started looking in the mirror and saying, God, why me? You know, I've, I've tried to do all the right things. I try to pe- treat people well and operate in integrity. So why is all of this happening? Why am I losing things left and right? Why will nobody help me? That's what I felt like in that moment. Why won't people hire me? Like, what is wrong with me? I had all the whys. And after bawling up on the floor and just crying and snotting and bawling, the Holy Spirit told me to get my Bible. And I ended up on Proverbs 17, 16. And it said, what good is money in the hands of a fool if they have no desire to seek wisdom? And... For some reason that just really, I know, I know what it is now, but in the moment it just really stuck with me. Like I couldn't get past that verse. I just read it over and over again. And I started to feel this. I started to just feel like, man, I need to share this. I need to tell people this. I wonder how many other people have been also mistaking knowledge for wisdom. Cause I always thought knowledge was wisdom. I used them interchangeably. And that verse forced me to go look it up. And when I looked it up, I saw that knowledge was education, but wisdom was how to apply it. And I got this burning desire to go tell people. So when I talk about my gift being talking and speaking, what ended up happening is because I couldn't find a job, which now I'm grateful that nobody would hire me, but at the time it didn't feel like it. But because I couldn't find a job, I started to think I just need to share this with people. I want to go tell people this. So that started with a a free blogspot.com. And that free blogspot.com, while I was receiving food stamps, while I was on welfare, is the thing that really launched me into who I am today. It started as a free blogspot. And the only thing that I knew was I feel compelled to share this with people. I feel compelled to tell people like, look, this journey is not just about chasing money. It's about seeking wisdom. Like let's look at Proverbs. Let's look at what, you know, these different verses say about money and business. And that is where it started. You couldn't have told me in that moment though, David, that it would turn into what it's become. I didn't see five books later. I didn't see national television. I didn't see international speaking. I didn't see anything. All I saw in that moment was You like to talk, talk about this. And that was the thing. And that has been the thing I've consistently done since March, 2009. And so what I would encourage people, again, we started this by just talking about really using this time to look at your gifts and, and really pray for me. It was like praying about God, what do I do next? And it didn't look like money, right? It did. And I know that it's so hard when you have needs, I completely get it, but I can only speak the truth about what my story was. It didn't look like immediate money. It just looked like following the call, like answering the call, the nudge that was in my spirit to like, go do this thing. And even in the midst of it, help other people. How did you manage this? And how did you manage your family? Um... I would say initially, when you say manage my family, just like my day-to-day life. Yeah. Yeah. That was difficult. I'm not going to lie because I know that there were times that my husband looked at me like, would you go get a real job? (laughs) Like, even though I was trying to get jobs and it just wasn't working out um, for me, you know, I think after a certain point, it probably took some months, I would say because I started to get God wings. And and I call God wings just those little confirmations that you're going in the right direction. And so my goal was to help people. And I would say, you know, an audience of one is still an audience. If one person tells me that this has been a blessing, I gotta keep going. And so every time someone would, you know, comment on that blog, on that freeblogspot.com, which is still up to this day. Um, Every time someone would comment on that blog or they would send me an email and then I started to get on social media, somebody tweeted me and say, oh, I really like that post. I would take it as a God wink and a nod that I was going in the right direction. And sometimes I think you have to be your own cheerleader in these types of situations. I can't say that my husband or anyone in my family in particular was immediately a cheerleader. 
at some point I had to accept the fact that the call was from God and the validation would have to come from God. I couldn't look to my family to validate a vision that was not given to them. And with every person that I helped, it was that nod. I took it as the nod that I just needed to keep going. And so it took years before, it took like a year and a half before it turned into like any money, like, like you know, money that was really um, impactful for my family. But I do think that they saw me feeling more fulfilled and purposeful because the more I helped other people and got that one comment, the more, the more fulfilled I was, like the more joy I had, the more confidence I had, the more um, affectionate I could be because I wasn't allowing my place myself to stay in this place of whining and complaining, which doesn't allow you to show up as your best self. So because I was just working on something that had deeper meaning, it allowed me to show up and then also be an encouragement for my husband. I think if I hadn't started doing what I was doing and finding meaning and fulfillment in it, we really could have, you know, I think we could have split up because so many people were at that time. It was just a very, and I could imagine, we've already heard the reports that, (laughs) you know, people who are sheltering in place are breaking up left and right, you know, um, I think the same thing was happening during the recession. We knew many people who were divorcing, but I think it took took my efforts with really trying to stay in alignment with what I felt like God was calling me to do to to show up as my most patient um, and most resilient and peaceful self because the work I was doing was fulfilling, even though I wasn't being paid yet. To to clarify this for our listeners, at that point in time, you both were in a position that you had to work. Oh, yeah. So my husband and I owned that real estate and mortgage brokerage together. So when we lost, we lost together. We were both (laughs) shaking out purses and looking for change. My husband, while I was getting that blog started, actually ended up taking a job at Taco Bell so that we would have health insurance. And here's a guy that was wearing tailored suits on any given day of the week. And, you know, we lived in a 6,000 square foot home before that foreclosed. And we had all the trinkets, all the things, all the trappings of success. And he went to go learn how to make a million different things out of lettuce, tomato, cheese, and beans. Like, and he was working at the drive through at Taco Bell. He also was not getting hired. You know, he has degrees and all that great stuff. Nobody was hiring him. And he literally went up and down. There's a street in Metairie, Uh, Louisiana, outside of New Orleans called Veterans Memorial Highway. And my husband went up and down this fast food strip to McDonald's, um, to KFC, I believe, to Hardee's until he got to Taco Bell. And that was the only person who would show like, you know, would show, show many mercy. And he said, look, I don't care about what's on my resume. I don't care about my background. I will clean the floor and scrub toilets. I just need health insurance for my family. And that person gave him a chance. And he ended up working there for almost 18 months. So this wasn't some overnight thing. My husband worked at Taco Bell for 18 months to make sure that we had food and, and you know, health insurance while I started to build what became this brand of America's Money Maven. That was what, 10 years ago? 11 years ago? Yeah, 11 years ago now. 11 years ago. So, give me, let's have a drum roll now, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Give me the bullet points, okay? Once you decided that that you were going to move forward, that you were going to have this, uh, uh, you, you, you had this vision, God gave you this game plan. Uh, you decided to go for it. Give me the bullet points. What has happened over that decade? So over the last decade, I went from that blog to writing for reputable websites like blackenterprise.com or Huffington Post. That led me to writing for magazines, also Black Enterprise, Upscale, Sheen. And those articles led me to doing radio interviews, which landed me on the Steve Harvey Morning Show where I was America's or the the money maven of the Steve Harvey Show for four years with a weekly segment answering people's personal finance questions. Uh, That also led me to television. 
so recurring voice on shows like Dr. Oz, The Steve Harvey Show, NBC, Fox News. And now I'm working on my fifth book, Redefine Wealth for Yourself, which is based on my top rated podcast, Redefining Wealth. Um, with Patrice Washington. We just crossed 2 million downloads a couple days ago, which is exciting. Um, And there, my whole goal is to share with people that wealth is so much more than money and material possessions. The original meaning is well-being. That's the original meaning of wealth. And so now I'm just on a mission to share with people all the things that I did over these 10 years, because it wasn't just looking at budgets and credit reports. I had to do the work in other areas of my life. I believe, in order to become who I am today and now to be able to sustain this type of season. So I went through that season only to get here 10, 11 years later um, and feel like I could weather this one a bit better. And your husband's no longer working at Taco Bell, I take it. No. (laughs) 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 About 18 months. Yeah, he's no longer working there. My husband's now in entertainment. He owns a production company. um, And he actually supports with my business as well. So, and we're back in real estate. We actually flip multi unit uh, apartment buildings. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Listen, I'm going to ask you to do one thing for us that uh, I I know uh, our, our, Listeners would really greatly appreciate. Would would you mind praying for our folks who are Absolutely. going through what they're going through right now and, and bless them? Absolutely. Oh, Father God, gracious Father, we are just so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful that nothing about what's going on during this season has caught you by surprise, Father God. We know that you have prepared and equipped Uh, your believers for such a time as this, God. And we just pray right now for every person, every household, every family that is being negatively impacted, but impacted overall, God. We pray for those that are grieving their sense of normalcy, Father God. We pray for those um, that are suffering job loss. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are just feeling despair, and feeling worried and feeling anxious about tomorrow, God. But your word says that we have no reason to worry about tomorrow, God. Your word says that you have plans to prosper us and not to harm us, Father God. Your word says that we need to be bold and courageous, Father God. And so we remind you and remind ourselves, God, that you are the one who will make our path straight, God. Whether we're in a pandemic or not, Everything that we need comes from you, O oh Father. And so I pray for the hearts and minds and souls and fears and doubts and insecurities of every person who is listening right now, God, that when we feel the things that we're feeling, God, that we allow ourselves to feel because we're human, God, but then that we surrender it to you, knowing that all things do come together for the good of those who love you, Father God. Thank you for peace. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for discernment. And thank you for loving us when we don't feel like loving ourselves and forgiving us when we don't feel forgivable, God, and just um, being who you are, all knowing and merciful, God. Thank you that this pandemic has come to slow us down and allow us to focus on what truly matters, which is what you have called us to do on this earth for such a time as this. Not one of us is here by mistake, God. We're here living through this season because you have a plan and we just pray that we can adhere to the plan as you have it lined out and just get in alignment. Um, We're grateful for who you are, for who you've always been and who you will continue to be. Um, We thank you for this time, even though we don't understand it, we thank you for it and we look forward, we wait with expectancy to what you will do and how you will show up in each and every one of our households. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. Patrice, thank you so much. Uh, you're such a blessing, and um, I really take to heart your story and your your testimony. And you know, the last time uh, we had John, uh, we had a tremendous number of downloads on the uh, podcast. Mm. And of course, I know the uh, we've aired on Keep the Faith, uh, probably your segments uh, dozens of times there on the uh, stations across the country. I just uh, wish you. Uh, so much um, opportunity ahead to spread uh, 
your your love, your 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 good news, and uh, your wisdom. Because uh, gosh, we we certainly uh, we certainly appreciate it, and I know um, the next few months, the next couple of years are going to be really difficult, a real challenge for folks, and. It's good to hear some good news coming from somebody who has lived through it and not just somebody who's speculative, and uh, uh, we certainly get a lot of bad news. So I just wanted to tell you how much I I, and all of us here appreciate you. Thank you so much. I'm so honored. I'm so honored. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, Patrice Washington, and oh my gosh, thank you for... Thank you for that prayer at the end. I, you know, I've never asked, ever, in 60-some episodes since we started this, I've never asked anyone to pray with us but uh, or pray for us. But you know what? I, I just knew that Patrice would would have something special for us, and, and what a blessing that was there at the uh, end of the interview. She is such a gem. I would highly recommend that you check her out at patricewashington.com. And on Amazon.com, all of her books are listed there. She will really help you get through this very difficult period, more so than anybody else that I know out there. And it's because, as I mentioned before, and as you heard in her story, she has lived it. Quotation marks around it. Okay? She's lived it, been through it, got out of it, and now she wants to help you recover from it all right please do check her out patricewashington.com thank you patrice for being here once again on cia contagious influencers of america the podcast now listen folks i know it's a very difficult time we're all going through this together and i i i don't want mean to sound like a psa and i don't mean to you know it seems like everybody's using the word together you know, we thought that 2020 was going to be this vision every year, you know, the vision of 2020, you know, but but it's turned out to be the the together year, you know. I don't I don't know about these words or who comes up with these words and and uh I know that sometimes you, you you come up with something and then it gets printed in a couple of publications and it gets on 60 minutes and then all of a sudden everybody starts using it, but uh This is definitely a time that uh, we're going through this, uh, and we're all part of – this is a global thing, all right? This is a global thing. And despite the fact that, you know, half of us think we should wear a mask and the other half don't think we should wear a mask and people are getting upset because, uh, you know, restaurants are open in one county, but they're not open in another county, believe me, I'm as frustrated as you are, all right? I'm quite happy because in my county in in Middle Tennessee – uh, I actually can get a haircut now, and I'm getting one tomorrow. And b- believe me, I need one badly. But California, they've just started curbside service. We, well, we had curbside service for restaurants from day one, and it was great. It, it, it kept a lot of restaurants going. Uh, they're just now doing it in, in, in uh, California in the last few days. Look, I know it's frustrating. You know, we're going to be going through this for months. But all I know is... There was that bad guy, Corona, that came in, stole all your tools in the middle of March. Your toolbox is empty. You're hurting right now. And we are going to spend several episodes helping you get those tools back, the tools that were robbed from you, okay? I'm going to try to get really good guests on here that's going to help you financially recover, emotionally recover, spiritually recover i'm going to to do whatever i can to get those kind of people on the podcast and of course on the keep the faith radio show every week uh we're we're doing the same thing all right so if you have somebody that you want us to feature please please do reach out to me and let me know we'll try to get them on please do go rate and review us on uh whatever platform you're you're listening to it's really important Please do share this podcast with someone right now who needs this information, all right? And whatever you do, go out there and live that life and live in color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living in black and white. I love you guys. 
We'll see you next time on CIA, Contagious Influencers of America, the podcast from the producers of Keep the Faith.